We're going to talk about what you went through, what you've been feeling, how you've been feeling, how you've done it to this day. How are you still here standing with us? No, no, no. All of my kid wanted was to see her baby sister. <laughs> oh, okay, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. They put her on a pillow. <laughs> what's up welcome back to gemini therapy i'm Lindsay, and i'm clary and you're now tuning into our second episode that's kind of crazy to say number two i know and we look official now i know do you guys like our little pink backdrop we're hoping to get a neon sign soon yes that will come but first of all we want to thank you guys so so much for all of the support and messages the dms that we got we really weren't expecting like so many like for it to affect, not affect, but like we we reached out to a lot of people through our very first episode and that's definitely what we wanted to do. I feel like for that sure. was our That like, was our goal. Yeah. <coughs> and we did exactly that plus more because I agree. We had so many not I don't want to say so many people, but we did have a lot of people reach out to us and just like show how much they related to us and I mm-hmm. think that at the end of the day that was what we wanted. And it's kind of I don't want to say that I didn't expect it from the people here in town, but mm-hmm. a lot of people are very shy. Yeah. So I don't expect them to open up to us. And they did. And it was kind of like, whoa, like, that's we, awesome. We went through some you guys reading your messages and stuff. First of all, we got a lot of comments on YouTube and that in itself was like breathtaking. But once we started receiving the DMs, the personal messages, yeah, like like how you guys could relate to us and then the ones that hit home those comments are based off of the like episode that we're going to film today basically it's the reason we're doing this today because we had we had something totally different planned planned for today we were going to talk either fertility or relationships y'all probably saw our instagram um, Mm -hmm. poll but with some of the messages we received Lindsay was like you know what I we, have to. we need to do it now and and like i told you the other day it's perfect because we already talked about it like you introduced it we're Let's kind of already on the it. topic yeah. let's go with it yeah. so if you guys thought that the first one was a tearjerker this one might be a little bit more of that i'm gonna try to like hold myself together because it is still very like a sensitive subject and it's still like stings and burns really really bad But basically, we're going to talk about life after loss. Um, If you guys are just tuning in, you guys didn't watch our very first episode. Um, I am going to be talking about how we lost our baby girl. She was nine days old when the Lord called her home and stuff. And she had um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome and Turner syndrome. And just the experience overall, how we've been able to deal. It's going to be two years um, this coming June. And I feel like a lot of the messages that we received on our Instagram page are kind of like people are just they can relate. Yeah, it's it's kind of like I think we're so shocked because a lot of the people that reached out and said, you know what, Lindsay, I went through this, too. And I went through this, too. And I went through this, too. It was kind of like you can't believe it because we live in such a small town and. You kind of hear everything that happens and these people were from our hometown and it's like we never heard of it yeah and like i can imagine i can put myself in their shoes all of the help that we received from our entire community and those people having to go through it alone is crazy like i don't know how they did it and i don't know how they didn't like reach out for not that they had to reach out for support and it's something it's a very like it's like a very sensitive subject and it's not something that you want to go out and talk about because I know I did it. The, like the only reason I was uploading it on YouTube was for other moms outside of our community to know about it because I not once ever posted on Facebook or Instagram. Like I would upload my pregnancy updates and stuff, but it wasn't until after you came in the picture that I was that I started being more vocal about our situation and like where we were at in life because everybody posts like I'm pregnant or like 
the bump dates and stuff, which are all great to see and stuff. And I was still doing that, but I didn't want to be that girl who people were going to be like, oh, look, pobrecita, she's going through that and stuff. And Because it, it just sucks. Like, it's not something that you think is going to ever happen to you, but it does. And that's life, and it happens. And it's okay. It's normal. Like, stuff like this happens every day to people that we know and people that we don't even that we don't even yeah. cross paths with, yeah. So I can relate so much to those people, and I'm not saying that they have to, like, post it on Facebook, like, oh, look at what I'm going through, because you most definitely do not have to. Um, and th like I said, the only reason I did was because I was getting help, and if it wasn't for you, I probably wouldn't have said anything at all. Like, I would have kept it private, and... YouTube, I feel like not a lot of people from town know that I do it because I don't even post. You don't post it on your personal pages. That I do it. Yeah, like my Facebook, Instagram is sort of like, yes, I'll post there, but not so much. So anyways. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started with the actual podcast. It's going to be a little bit different this time because I'm going to be asking Lindsay questions and you're going to hear a lot of her, I guess you want to say like uh, venting and her journey and what she went through grieving her daughter. But and I mean, you, you can't say what she went through because she's still going through it. Like grief is something that you go through for the rest of your life, especially with when it's your child. Yeah. Because it's something that you move on. You move on in life, but you're always going to carry her with you. Right. So you're never really going to end grieving. No. But for now, we're going to talk about what you went through, what you've been feeling, how you've been feeling, how you've done it to this day. How are you still here standing with us? So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and open my phone. I have a couple of notes, some questions that I have written down here. Okay. And I'm going to ask her. Okay, ready? Yes. No. Yes. I'm a little nervous. Okay. If we cry, we cry. We don't cry. We don't cry. It's okay. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I didn't cry last time. I held it in real good. I know. You did a very good job. Okay. Ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm going in deep. Go for it. Okay. All right. You're at the hospital. Mm-hmm. You f your doctors come in and they tell you, you know what, there's nothing we can do for her. Um, we thought we'd, we were going to be able to do the three surgeries. Not after all. She's not going to make it at that moment. What did you feel? How did you react? <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, what, what, what went through your head? Was it like, oh, my God, I need to start taking a lot of pictures with her. What am I going to do? Like, what, what was in your head at that moment? Num numbness or... I was, I, like, dude, like, tunnel. Um, dark. You just went dark. No, like, I'm going back to that day, that morning, because it happened at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I remember she was born June 15th, 2020. I had her. I'm going to, it's going to be like a, I'm going back. So I had her June 15th at 10 about 10 30 in the morning at texas children's hospital in houston you guys know that we had to relocate for about a month but prior like to like six weeks before my due date so we were living in houston we had to rent an apartment and everything we're at the hospital we had to be there at eight in the morning june 15th so we get there i remember posting on instagram like super excited i'm gonna have her i'm finally gonna meet my baby and stuff um, the doctors, the, I had a doctor's appointment the day before that. And they, you know, they told me everything. We talked about everything. Basically like the plan. He told, there was literally about 20 people in the operating room. Cause I did have to have a C-section. They did offer to do a V-back because my first pregnancy was a cesarean section. And I told them that I didn't want to do the, like try the other kind like vaginal because I already knew what it felt like to have, have a c-section so i was just like do it again um so i was prepped and ready to go by like 9 45 i have her they show her to me they whisk her away birds sitting right next to me and i f everything felt like normal because it felt normal and then it wasn't after like 15 minutes that I see more and more and more doctors just standing all around her little, the, what is it called? The incubator, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
I could be wrong. I don't know. But the little like bassinet thingy that they put them in. Um, and I kept telling Bert like, "Is everything okay?" And I, she was yelling, she was screaming, she was mad. And I remember like laying on the table, and just like praying and saying, "I want her to, I want to hear her cry," because they told me like, "We don't know how she's gonna come out. We don't know if she's gonna be blue," because they told me as soon as she's out you're no longer doing the work for her like she's gonna have to do it on her own and this the with her having hypoplastic left heart syndrome that's basically the left side of her heart didn't develop so she pretty much had a I don't know how to explain it like half a horseshoe if that makes sense kind of shaped heart so she was missing half a heart and the oxygen, she, she wasn't going to be able to breathe on her own and stuff. So they pretty much told me, like, we don't know how, if she's going to be breathing on her own, what's going to happen. Like, we're just going to roll with it. So I was laying there praying, hoping to just hear her cry. Like, I just wanted to, you know, hear that. And sure enough, she was. She was very, very angry. And the doctors kept telling me she's really cold because she's upset. I remember, like, the doctor's coming up to me and telling me like are you okay mom you know she seems to be doing okay but we are gonna run um I forgot what a lot of the the stuff is but basically it was like a little tube that they had to run through her belly button and that was gonna be some sort of medicine that was gonna keep her heart one of her one of the valves on her heart open without that medication she would have died like instantly so they told me that's one of the wires that she's gonna have through her belly button. I think she had like two more that were giving her other sorts of medications and stuff. But then they were able to stabilize her and stuff. They did put her on oxygen almost right away. And I had to go to recovery. They stitched me up, they wheeled me away. I had to go to recovery for two hours. And Bert was with her for the rest of the day. Um, I didn't see her until 12 o'clock midnight. So I was alone all of that day. Were you getting updates on how she was doing? You and Bert were texting and stuff? Bert would call me FaceTime. Like I was, I don't think I even slept. You didn't recover? No, there was no, no, literally, like there was absolutely no recovering. I went back to the room. I was on the phone with him, FaceTiming him, calling him, and doctors were going in to talk to him. And I remember him telling me like, you were the one who knew everything. Like, you were the one going to the doctor's appointments. And now I'm sitting here and, like, I feel like he did a very, very good job because, of course, I would let him know everything after every doctor's appointment because he was away at work for most of them. And then with COVID, he wasn't able to go inside with me anyways. Um, and he did an amazing job like pulling through for me since I wasn't able to be there like talking to the doctors myself and stuff and the one doctor who gave us so much hope was the gosh I forgot what she was called but she was basically like the genetics doctor and um I hated her why I hated her so much I hope she doesn't see this I hope not, <laughs> but I, a lot of my resentment was, Towards and I've her. never told anybody this, never, I've never, not even Bert, but oh. when she told Bert that she looked like an absolutely normal, beautiful baby, that she wasn't, she, she, she basically told us, like, your daughter doesn't have Turner Syndrome, she looks like a normal baby, because kids with Turner Syndrome have physical features, um, one of them being that they have a very, a very wide neck. Um, they're very small, short in stature. Like if she would have grown up, she would have been a very small, short person. Um, her limbs would have been very short. Um, the only thing that she had was a little peck of a nail on her pinky nail. Oh, really? Like her full fingernail didn't, didn't grow, grow up. up. It was just like a choop, like a little peck oh. of nail. And it was on her little pinky. Um, but they measured her. They did everything. They measured her head, her neck, her arms, her legs. She had all 10 fingers. I mean, 
yeah, all 10 fingers, all mm-hmm. 10 toes, and she looked normal. And after she passed, that's that was the question that everybody gave us. Like, si se miraba bien, what happened? Or, mm-hmm. like, what like was why? it? Yeah. And I would tell them, like, she had two syndromes. But why if she looked like a normal baby? And I can't answer that. Like, I was literally expecting to see a baby that wasn't going to look normal. normal. Yeah. But she was beautiful. She she really was the most beautiful baby. She was like a little doll. She really was. And so I, like, grew to hate that doctor because I feel like if you haven't ran tests, don't tell parents that she doesn't have it just because she looks okay. And so as soon as Britt told me that, like, I felt like I could breathe. And I was like, perfect, she doesn't have it. She's going to be able to have the surgeries. And the first surgery that she would have had would have, based off of how bad her heart was, I think it would have been, like, right the next day, or for sure during the very first week of her life. Um... But that same day, they ended up doing the, the genetic testing on her and stuff, and they told us it's going to take a full 20, 24 to 48 hours to get the results back. So that night, I remember it was already June 16th in the morning. It was like 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm re- recovering from a C-section. Bert puts my ass on a wheelchair and wheels me to the next tower over. Because he's, they finally tell me like, if you want to go see her, you're gonna okay. have to go see her in the, the CICU, which is the, the child, the, <coughs> cardiac, um, ICU. And so I told him I was like, let's do it, and I told him like, you're gonna have to wheel me there because obviously I can't walk yet. And there we go to the next tower over, and these buildings are humongous. We had to go downstairs like. Elevators, you're rolling. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> elevators, like eight floors down and then another eight up and cross a bridge to the next building over. And it it was so much. A freaking marathon, it felt like. So we get there, we finally see her, and I'm, I go up to her, and she's just laying there, like, so peacefully, but there's wires everywhere. There's little patches all over her chest, on her head. She's in her diaper like they just have her like wrapped in a blanket and stuff and they asked me like do you want to oh no 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 they told me you can't like i literally went in to To grab grab her her. not even thinking like that there's wires everywhere i just wanted to hold her and they were like no 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 you can't carry her yet and i was like but why like i'm okay and they're like you can't carry her yet so that freaking broke me, and then I was trying to record her, and they got mad at me for recording her also. My whole family back home is like, well, what's going on? What, like, what, what does she look like? Because I, I haven't sent pictures to anybody. Nobody knows what she looks like. They just know that she was born, that she's, she's stable, that I'm okay. And I think they didn't hear from us until the next day. This and whole time your mom is there, or no? My mom, because I remember you telling me something like, "Where was where was Grecia at this at this time?" She was with my mom at the hot, at the at the apartment. So that she we, was in Houston yeah. with you. Um, my mom was there. She was, stayed with us the entire time that we were over there. And then the day that she was born, I think like two days or a day before she was born, Bert's brother, his sister, her sister's husband, her daughter was there. Um, my cousin, my sister, basically, like, all of the people that I needed to be there to help, like, go through all of that. I was worried at the same time for Grecia because we had never slept without her a day in her life prior to that. And, like, I wanted Wendy to be there so bad so that Brie could kind of be like a distraction to her and stuff. And my my sister helped out a ton because she ended up sleeping with my sister and she didn't sleep with my mom because I was so worried. Like, where she's so used to sleeping with us, how is she going to sleep without us? But she was able to do it. She was a big girl. 
and we were away from her for three days. Okay, hey, take us back to let's, the hospital. Let's okay. Put yourself. Where were you when your doctors came in and said, "You know what? We cannot do the surgery after all." I was in her room. We were. It was two days before I was gonna get discharged, and the doctors were so sweet. You're supposed to stay in the hospital for like three days. And my doctor ended up telling me, like, tell them you're, like, you're in a lot of pain so that you can stay an extra two days. So that both of us could stay an extra two days. Because if not, like, as soon as both of us, as soon as I would have been discharged, only one of us was going to be able to come in every 24 hours. So it was either me or Bert. And so he's like, I know that you guys want to so badly both be with your baby, like, not knowing the, like, what was going to happen. So I don't even remember what lie I told them, but I was like, I don't feel good. I need to stay. And they did. So I was in the hospital for five, five of those nine days. And then the other couple days, either Bert would go or I would go. And it was just one of us, at, like, for one day. And then the next day we would switch and stuff. And so... Finally, we get the results back, and they call us, and they tell us, we're going to meet with you at, like, 12 or whatever. And so we tell them, okay, well, obviously, we're going to be there with her, so we'll, we'll be waiting for you and stuff. And the doctors came in, and they told us, like, how we were doing or whatever, and we were like, fine, I guess. You know, I want to know about my kid. Get to the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... They said there was like three doctors on. I don't even know why there was three of them. I just wanted to talk to that freaking lady who told us that she was going to be OK. And then tells us like, no, sorry, your daughter has. I should have been more prepared. But like I said, it's not something that I lay in bed now and I'm like, ooh, Turner syndrome. No, like that's the last thing I want to freaking Google because for five months, that's all I did. Literally 24 seven. And you would think. That it'd be, like, engraved in my head? No, I do not think that because you lost your daughter to Turner Syndrome, so that's something that you want to bury and never look at again. So I'm not Literally, surprised that you forgot about it. It's, I don't remember. There's just, a like, a norm, not normal, but, like, a livable one, and then there's one that's very, very bad. And my daughter ended up having the very, very bad one. And so because of the very bad one, they weren't able to go forward with her surgeries with her having hlhs and so they tell us like she's not gonna survive we're gonna like we can keep her connected for as long as you want but as soon as we disconnect her like her heart is slowly gonna just shut off and I, like at that moment we were we were we were destroyed, but at the same time, we were fine with it because they had already told us the possibilities of her not making it and stuff. So I don't remember how far along I was at the time, but Bert and I, I remember one of my, I think it was the that, that appointment that we went to in Houston. We literally drove from Houston to Laredo and none of us, we didn't say a word to each other. Because it was that day that they told us, if she's born with it, there's nothing that we can do and your daughter is going to die. And I remember telling him, like, how is that even possible? And we were kind of like in shock. I remember him calling his mom and telling him, like, if she has it, there's nothing that they can do. And she, I remember she was so mad. And... She was literally, like, yelling at him over the phone, like, how are they, like, are the doctors stupid? There has to be something that they can do. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and he just kept telling them, like, there's not, because there is nothing, nothing can be done if she has both. <laughs> and... We talked about it, and I told him, like, if she has the one that isn't so bad, are you going to want to put her through all of those surgeries? Because they told us she can have it, like the lesser one, 
we can try the first surgery, but most babies die anyways. So you're just going to put her through an open heart surgery. She's never going to be normal because even even at that, at three open heart surgeries, she would have never been a normal kid. Her heart never would have been whole. She was always going to have a broken heart. We talked about it and we like, we didn't want to put her through that. So even if she would have been a candidate to have her surgeries, we weren't going to, God, I've never, I've, it's not something you say. Like, I'm not, I would have never told you, like, like, I wasn't going to choose for my daughter to go through these surgeries. But anyways, we didn't. Because why are we going to put her through excruciating pain where she was going to be, like, hooked up to morphine 24-7? She was never, basically, like, she was never going to wake up. And so we said, like, no. If that's going to be her future, like, what future is that going to be? Um, so once the doctors told us she's not going to make it, we have to, we're going to have to eventually disconnect her. We kind of just, like, savored in the next 24 hours. Because I think it was maybe, like, 30, 35 hours that we had with her after they told us. And so everyone is back at the apartment. We call them. We tell them what we were just told. And everyone is so, like, well, can we see her? Like, what's going to happen? And it's covid Nobody was allowed in the hospital if you weren't um, like me. I, like I was a patient there, so if you weren't a patient or like the like my like the husband or whatever, then you couldn't go inside. And I remember telling the doctors like, if she's gonna pass away, then let us take her home. Let us take her back to Zapata so that my family, our family, can meet her and you know, just let her go peacefully in her own house. And they tr we tried making arrangements. We tried putting her in, it was like some different kind of facility, like right down the road. Like a hospice facility? Yeah, hospice. They didn't allow it either. We tried getting like air vac to where we could bring her home in a, in a helicopter. They didn't allow it either. So I was like, so what? Like are me and Bert going to be the only ones who get to see her alive? And pretty much, yes. Um, but I guess there are good people out there. And the I remember her name was Sap, the her nurse. She was she must have been like in her mid twenties. She was a super super young <coughs> nurse. And every day that we were like that, we would go. I remember Bert and I telling each other like, "Oh, I hope Sam's there," because she was super super sweet. She's the one who made her, like, the, her name. The Lucia sign. That's on her, the picture, whatever. She was super sweet. And it was her and this other girl, but I forgot her name. But Sam was the super, like, the sweetest. And she told us, she was like, you know what? I'm going to try to talk to the head of something to see what I can do for you guys. But she was like, I'm not making any promises. So she ended up being able to have my mom and Bert's mom, only them, go in to see her. And they were able to go the next day. And even Grecia was able to go. But it was so hard to get Grecia to go in there because they weren't allowing kids under 12. And I remember crying to one doctor. I don't even know what doctor it was. And I told them, like, all of my kid wanted was to see her baby sister. <laughs> so like I need her to meet her and they were like okay but there's only going to be two people that can come in at a time to see her so it was Bert and I and then we called our moms in to go in and they spent maybe like half an hour with her and then Grecia was able to go in and I wanted to be there like to take pictures of them with her and Grecia like the grandmas with both of the girls and it wasn't allowed because they kept telling us only two people at a time 
And I remember Sam was like, no, let her come. Like, she's a little girl. And Grecia was able to go in. This is so hard. <laughs> Wait. And let it out. Let me say this really quick now that I'm not crying. Grecia was able to go in and see her, and I have a video on my Instagram of her singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. She's singing to her in my belly, and I'm going to try to say it super fast, but she was able to go have her on her lap. She, they put her on a pillow. You're fine, you're fine. She was able to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star to her little sister. And I remember now that we're home, she'll tell me like every now and then, like, Mom, remember I was able to sing to her. And I tell her, yes, Mommy, you were able to do that. And that's like her favorite thing. And she'll go back and look at her pictures. And I have the video of her singing to her and stuff. And, um... But yeah, like to answer your question, I guess we were, we had already accepted the possibilities of losing her. And although like we didn't know the outcome, like we were ready for it, we had already said, we had already told ourselves like it could happen. So like prepare yourself. So we were ready for the worst, but of course, we weren't we weren't going into it like expecting that. But if it happened, we were going to be, you know, you're never really prepared, but you were as prepared as you could be, I guess you can say. Yeah. And I had already been like talking to Grecia about it and telling her, like, there's a possibility that baby Lucia is going to go to heaven. And at first, she didn't really understand, like, why. But I'll let you go on to your next question. Well, I just from there I just want to know like it basically goes on to the waiting period of not knowing like the waiting period of after finding that out to her passing away but you kind of already went into that mm -hmm. y'all spend time with her and then from there <coughs> she passes and you start planning her funeral you come home how was it getting here to Zapata without so what you were supposed to be coming home with the morning that she passed away it was at four i think it was like at four thirty four in the morning we were with her she i was holding her and it took forever to put her down but i know like, I knew that I couldn't stay there forever. So I ended up putting her down, finally. And I remember, like, walking. Honestly, the only thing that I remember is walking down that one hallway. And it's like I flew back to the apartment. I remember it was still dark outside. And there was mattresses like inflatable mattresses all over the living room at the apartment and as soon as we walked in everybody kind of just like everybody woke up nobody said anything because i walked straight to the room and i slept for maybe like three hours um i don't even think bert slept at all But I remember as soon as I woke up, my mom and my swag and I were trying to, like, make me food and stuff. And I told them, I, let's go. We're leaving. And they were like, but wait, we don't have. We literally brought all of our stuff from home and all of the other stuff that we had bought to literally make that apartment livable. We couldn't fit all of the stuff that we had in that little apartment in our 
what four vehicles to come back home but i just kept telling them like i don't want to be in houston anymore we need to go home now and this was already at nine days um i felt like i was going crazy i was in so much freaking pain because while we were still in the hospital there was this stupid nurse who kept pushing me into pumping and I kept telling her she kept telling me you need to pump you need to pump your breast milk because it's going to help her and she even went to tell me like this could save her so I did pump like twice and I think that made my milk go crazy and I was like I had a freaking overload of milk my breasts were so big and hard and full and I like what do I do what was I supposed to do like I didn't have a kid to feed anymore so I remember like sitting on the sofa literally like drippy and I tell my mom and my mother-in-law and I'm telling them like this isn't fair So I got up and I went to the shower and I was just like letting like everything just come out because I didn't want to feel to be in that pain on top of the pain that I was already feeling. And I think like right the next day, all the guys went out to find U-Hauls, I think even family that was in Sabat that was offering to drive to Houston to like just to offer their vehicle so that we could come home like ASAP but finally we were able to come home and it was on Bert's birthday so we were in Houston for my birthday she was born June 15th my, with who which she shared a birthday with my dad we were in the hospital for our anniversary June 17th and then June 24th she passes away and then June 25th is Bird's birthday so on his birthday we're driving home and at, I remember finding out I was pregnant like all we ever wanted was to have a summer baby so that um, we could have one in December and six months later have another baby who was going to be born in June and we were able to get that we were so excited and then I said, if if my baby is able to be born on my dad's birthday, that's even better because that's like all my dad ever wanted also. And June was supposed to be like the happiest month of our life, having our birthdays, our wedding anniversary and everything. And now it's like the month that I dread the freaking most. Like I hate it. Um, so we got home and just... <laughs> walking through the doors of that house like I was so happy to be home but at the same time like for the next couple days weeks months I felt like that I still feel like there's a chunk of me that's missing like I'm not whole you didn't come back complete <clears throat> nope okay so the weeks to come at home Bert leaves to work and life goes on with Gracia. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? I just did it. I remember wanting to just stay in bed, not wanting to do anything, not wanting to get up and make my, like my daughter food because that alone felt like a lot. And I remember her telling me, like, Mom, let's go play. And I would tell her, like, no, Mommy, later. <laughs> or in a little bit, because I don't feel good. And that was, like, maybe, like, the first week after Bert left that I kept kind of, I don't want to say, like, pushing her away, because I wouldn't. If anything, I held on to her a lot more. And I would tell her, like, <laughs> that I couldn't do it because Mommy felt sad. And 
I would communicate a lot with her. And we had so many, like, cry-out sessions. Me and her, we still cry together. Um, and sometimes she'll even come up to me and she'll tell me, like, Mom, I'm sad. I miss my baby sister. And so we just hug it out. And we cry. And I talk to her, like, all the time. I tell her that it's not bad. And that she's in a good place. And I feel like me talking to her about this situation, what was what pulled me out of that dark, depressing place that I was in. And she helped me a lot because if it wasn't like, honestly, if I didn't have Grecia, I, I don't know if I'd be here or what the heck I'd be doing. And we still like, I remember her asking me, like, Mom, but why her? What was so wrong with her that God wanted her to go with him? And I would just tell her, like, she was going to have, we called it a zipper on her chest. And she was going to need a special Band-Aid. And that only, that only God could give her that Band-Aid. And so she needed... He needed her to go with him. And that's the only way that I ever made her understand, like, that her leaving us wasn't bad. And even though she wasn't going to be with us, it was still okay, and we were still going to be okay. Okay, so soon after that, you guys took a little family trip. Mm -hmm. In July. Did you want to go? No. Did it help you? For like a little bit. But I feel like that trip was more for Bert because he's the type of person that keeps himself busy. When something bad happens, like he's just go, go, go. And he keeps himself busy, I feel like to distract himself from feeling anything and i'm the total opposite if i'm gonna feel it like i want to sit there and indulge in the freaking feeling like let myself feel sad because it's okay if i'm gonna be sad like just leave me alone and let me cry it out and then i'm gonna you know i'll i'll be fine just leave me alone and this trip that we went on was with his best friend and like his entire family and we're very close to that family and I remember like we it was like a camping trip but we were staying in a cabin and I decided to go on that trip for Bert because he was very excited to go on it and I said yes for Grecia to go out because they have five kids and I said let it let, like let's go so she can have fun, so she can distract herself from everything that's been happening. But to be honest, no. You were not in it? No. And as much as I made it seem like I was having a good time, at the end of the day, like, I wasn't whole. Like, I wasn't even enjoying it. I wasn't, not fully. Did you feel any regret while being there? Did you feel guilty? Did you yes, feel bad? Because I felt like I should have been at home grieving. But if I would have been at home grieving, what was that going to do? And I felt and then I felt guilty for wanting to be home and grieving because what about Grecia? What about Bert? He was grieving in his own way. Grecia didn't know what was going on. She didn't deserve to see me sad and crying all the time because she didn't understand it she was only three at the time so that guilt was just another emotion that i piled on to my back and i just went with it i'd figure it out on my own do you still that do you still feel like you're figuring it out on your own yeah because i hold a lot of stuff in and you're not supposed to do that Definitely, we we do not. We're not supposed to. Okay. 
when at what point in your your months passing or what point did you realize all right it's time get your ass out of bed go to the gym get back to life how much how much energy did it take from you it takes everything every morning to get out of bed I don't think I've ever felt like a day where I don't think about her or the situation. Like it's always there. She's always she's always in the back of my mind. But once I started working, it got a little bit easier. And I knew like I had to I had a how do you say it? Like a compromiso to to be somewhere like somebody else needed me to be doing something and then working on working out just came with it like i was already there where where we work it's right next door to a gym so i figured why not if i'm already here and then once i started i started feeling a little bit better because i was able to express my anger my depression or whatever through a different kind of feeling but there's not like a I don't I don't think there was a certain date or time. There's no there was no way of saying like, you know what, okay, I'm too deep in the hole. I need to get up and go. Well there was, but I can't tell you like an exact date or at how many months after I just I just knew it had to be done. I couldn't let myself stay there. You think that work saved you? Yes. And I'm so grateful for it. Okay. I don't want to ask you. What? Don't cry on me, Claudia. <laughs> okay. 2021 rolls around. <sighs> 2021 rolls around and you lose two more very important people in your life. Mm-hmm. And how does that add to the grief that you're already feeling? And how, have, how are you still here? So exactly a year later, my dad passes away. They're born on the same day, and a year and a day later, my dad passes away. Grecia, my dad born June 15th. My Luc, what did I say, Grecia? <laughs> Lucia passes away June 25th. Oh, sorry, sorry. June 25th, we come home June 26th. Um, my dad passes away June 24th, a year and a day later. And my dad was also a very sick man. We knew that it was coming. Uh, the doctors kept telling him, like, you have to take care of yourself. We kept we kept telling him, like, Dad, stop drinking. Cuidate, you know. And he was a very stubborn man. But I feel good knowing that I was there for my dad as much as I could be, you know, with work and stuff. And Gabby was so, like, um, understanding with everything because I would get days off to take him to the doctor and stuff. And For the funeral, I got, like, a week off, I think. And it was hard, but what made me feel a little bit better was that they were going to be together and she wasn't going to go be there alone and i remember him telling me like one time that he was in the hospital he he, um he told me that he wasn't scared to go because he was going to go be with his parents 
with his brother and my baby. And he said, uh, cuando, yo me voy, cuando yo me vaya, te la voy a cuidar. So, when finally, like, he passed away, we were with him till the very end. And um, I felt better knowing that he wasn't in pain because towards the end it was very bad. He had to be, like, he had just had a surgery a week, um, like, not even a week, a couple of days prior to him passing. So he wasn't even there anymore. And it's crazy how it was uh, the same days, like, just June in itself freaking sucks now. Like, I hate it so much. It's a month that I dread. And then um, three months before that, my brother-in-law passes away. And um, you weren't expecting that one. No, it was very, 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 very unexpected. I won't say how it happened, but it was it literally hit us like a ton of bricks. Um, And that hurt because he was. What felt like it is. He has everything. One of her favorite uncles besides my brother. Um, He would call. He was living in San Antonio. And he would call her like every other day. And it was. I mean sometimes he would even call me. And he'd be like hey just put my princess monster on the phone. And I'd be like well hey. Like good to hear from you. (laughs) But he'd be like just put her on the phone. And she would look forward to his phone calls all of the time. And he was away for maybe like the first three years of her life. And then he moved. He came home and she was with him like all the time. He was always at her house visiting and stuff. And then he moved to San Antonio and. She kind of saw him less, but we would we went to go see him a couple times, and each time she was so excited to go, and he was her everything, and I didn't think that after losing him, I'd have another one just three months later. Just to answer your question, like, how am I still here? Like, how do I still do live? You just have to get up and do it. Do you feel like you're grieving them all together? Have you, like... I don't want to say you're grieving them and you already grieved one of them and you're moving on. No, like, how how is that? How do you feel the grief from both of them? I mean, from all three of them. I feel like I've accepted it. Like, I've accepted that they're all gone. I'm still grieving them. Um, I just... I guess my question is, like, do you ever feel, like, when you're sad about Lucia, does the pain of your dad pile on top of it? Mm-hmm. Or is it, like, you're sad for Lucia and I'm sad for my dad, like, separate, kind of? I just ask myself, like, why? A lot. And I'll never know why. I'll never know why it happened that way. I'll never know why three people in my life, like, left so fast. But it's not just me. Like, everybody loses their loved ones all the time, and I don't know. Like, just this morning, I was getting ready, and I was thinking of, of Lionel. And I, and, I, and I guess because I knew what I was going to, like, what we were going to do today, but he was just so, like, in my head. And I wasn't thinking about Lucy. I wasn't thinking of my, my, about my dad. It was just him. And I was asking myself, like, why did you have to go? But we'll never know why. And I asked myself, like, what would life be like if he was still here? So I guess it's just, like, the moments, I guess. I grieve for them sometimes all together. Or some days it's just separately. Okay, so now, like we mentioned earlier, Grief is never over. You kind of go through through life grieving for the rest of your life, and you're never, you're never, like you say, you accept it, but you're never going to move on, and you're always going to remember them and carry them in your hearts. But where, where do you think you're at now, from square one? Do you think you're doing better, 
or do you feel equally broken as you did from day one? No, I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Are you sure? No. I don't. Like some days you just block it off. Like I tell, like. There's some days where it just piles up so much that those days, like, I know, like, I can't just let yourself feel it. And most of those days are during the week. And I'm pretty sure you notice, like, my off days. But those are the days that I'll literally just go home and I just, I just want to be home in my bed. And... Like, I'll just have a cry session, and then I'm okay. I feel like that, I feel like crying is very, it's okay to cry, and I think we need to cry, and there's a lot of people in this world that don't cry, but um, I think crying is very important. It's a way that we just let out all our emotions, and I know my mom telling me all the time, like, stop being prideful, and just let it out because i would people would ask me like how are you and i would tell them i'm okay i'm fine there's nothing wrong with me i'm i'm okay or she would want to sit me down and like talk to me about it and i've broken down with my mom a handful of times and she like especially towards bert she would tell me like stop being prideful remember he's going through it also and that was a very hard um point of our grieving next question okay <sighs> okay now that we've gotten through everything you've been through and we've talked about it i want to talk about now like dealing with life today so do you feel some sort of way seeing people announce their pregnancy and having babies Posting pictures of babies, Lucia's age, Father's Day, how to put pictures with their dads. That hurts. But it's not their fault. No, of course it's not. And it, but at the same time, your feelings are valid. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to be honest. While we were going through everything, um, social media is a big thing nowadays so like petty of me though i feel i don't find it petty um but i did unfollow a handful of people who were pregnant at the same time as i was and you know we went on to having our babies and i just couldn't see that and a lot of those women were like like only had one kid and they were going on their second like i was so I couldn't stand to see like their happy pictures with both of their kids, but here I was with just one. So I unfollowed a lot of them. I unsubscribed from a lot of families on YouTube because I couldn't watch them. I didn't think it was fair that how come they were so happy, but I wasn't. I didn't think it was fair. And I only follow this one family who has two little girls also. But there's just something about them that I kind of, like, find comfort in. And I won't say who they are, but I just, uh, like, that one family in in particular, like, I really like them. They give you peace. Yeah, like, I love watching the little girls play together. Like, I see Grecia and Lucia. Like, if she would have been here, I feel like that would have been then. You kind of imagine. Yeah. Do you find yourself doing that a lot? Yes. When you're, like, out at stores and stuff. (coughs) Like, oh, look, that would have been. Yes, all the time. Or, like, I see, like, those little girls. I see little girls at the stores, and I, I feel bad because Grecia wants that so bad. And I feel bad because I couldn't give her that as much as I wanted to. Like, it didn't work out that way. 
But because that's not your fault. No. I just don't get how life is so unfair. It's just life. Let's go to talking about how, like how hard is it for you now to go and visit your dad and Lucia. It's gotten a lot harder. Before, I feel like I would go all the time. Have you ever taken Gracia? Oh, yeah, all the time. She loves going. And sometimes she'll even tell me, like, Mom, let's go to the cemetery. But recently, it's just gotten so hard to go. Not that I enjoy it more, but I just feel, <coughs> like, unrushed whenever I go by myself. But... I mean, that's hard. Yeah. It's gotten harder, but my plans are to hopefully go soon. Yeah. And I, and as a matter of fact, I just told Bert this morning that we needed to go and decorate for the spring and stuff and make it all cute and nice and stuff. Okay. Now, these are like kind of like little bonus questions that if you want to answer, you can. If you don't want to, skip. What has been helping you the most right now? Like getting out of bed, what has been helping you out? Not getting out of bed, but like, okay, start over, scratch that. What has been helping you out the most right now to function, to wake up, to go on with life, to be happy and have good days? Work. I'm going to say being in school, keeping her busy, but at the same time, I feel like I'm putting a lot on my plate. I feel like there's not enough hours in a day. And I kind of overwhelm myself because I want to do so much. But at the same time, I just want to go home and go to bed. Um, like right now, we work from 8 to 5. I wake up at 5 in the morning, Monday through Friday. Grecia goes to school from 8 to 3. I don't get home till 5. And then um, some days during the week, she has dance from 5 to 6. I'm currently trying to convince Bert to put her in T-ball, but he's like, we don't have the time to do it. But that's just me, like, wanting to keep myself busy, but I'm exhausted at the same time. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but just keeping myself busy and knowing that I have that I have stuff to do and everything that's happening at work, like, I just feel like I have to be at 100 all the time and I don't have time to be sad so I just have to like get my ass up and go do you give yourself time to be sad though like do you do that for yourself because at the same time like you said we keep everything piled up and that's not good I have the days out of the week that you just let yourself go yeah alone yes and it happens like once a month that I that, that I can that I know for a fact, like, I think the last time that I just got home and cried was maybe like a month ago. That I even cried on my way home. That was my next question. What was your last cry session? Uh, like about a month ago. I mean, no. Right we, now. <laughs> right now. We went to Laredo the other day together. Yeah. We had a cry out session in the car. But me by myself, uh, like a month ago. And I felt angry that day. And just let it all out. Yeah. I feel like we have to do that sometimes. It's just. Yes. Okay. Another one of my questions is, what do you wish people would say to you? Like, if they could tell you something to make you feel better, is there anything somebody can say? No. And to be honest, I don't want to hear it. Like, I remember at the beginning, I would get so mad. Not mad, but it would bother me. And I know that people were only doing it with the best intentions. But they would tell me, like, I'm sorry you're going through this. I'm sorry it happened to you. I don't know what it feels like. Just. I, it sounds like it sounds like I'm being an asshole. Just say it. That's what you felt. And your feelings are valid. Yeah. Like it would piss me off so much when people would tell me, like, I feel so bad for you. Don't you know? Fuck you. Yeah. Like, just fuck off, dude. Leave me alone. But I know that they were trying to be there for me. 
I feel like in moments like that, you don't want people to be there for you. You kind of just want them. And I feel like that's a lot of, that's something we should all know if anybody if that's listening to us. If you have somebody going through something um, similar to what Lindsay has gone through, I sometimes find myself telling her words of encouragement, I guess you can say. And in and the back of my head, I'm like, does it even work? Yeah, is it no, even yes. helpful? Yes, it does. Because I will say a lot of, a lot of the times where, like I just need to get up and go. It's because I know people are cheering me on. And I know there's people like you telling me like, you can do this. You can get up and you can go and you can have a good life even though you just lost your kid, your dad, your brother-in-law. Life goes on. And you can't, you cannot like stay in that dark hole because what is that going to do? It's not going to do anything. You being depressed, you staying in bed all day isn't going to bring your baby back it's not going to bring your dad back your mom back your sister your brother your grandpa your grandma your cousin like no you have to like let yourself like be in the moment be in the moment like i said in the last in episode one like if you're sad be sad if you're mad be mad just let it happen and then move on, kind of. Yeah, because life goes on. And you can't, you can't keep yourself in that dark place because you're not helping yourself. It's not healthy at all to stay sad or angry. or It's hard. It definitely is hard to get up and go mm-hmm. on and move on and you feel guilty. And but you can grieve and have a life. Yes, it's normal. Yes, it is. And if if like if somebody out there is going through what I went through and losing a baby and stuff, just don't stay there. Because it's not a nice place. It's a very, very ugly, dark place. And if you don't want to talk about it, write it down. I remember Ash giving me like a little journal notebook and she told me just if you don't want to talk about it, write it down. Once you fill up that book, burn it or freaking burn it because you don't want anybody reading it. (laughs) I don't think I wouldn't want anyone reading mine or go to therapy. I feel like therapy is (laughs) 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 or click that subscribe button. (laughs) Um, No. Yeah, I feel like therapy. It's not it's not for so many people. No, because honestly, I never thought about it. I don't think it's for a lot of people. I personally um I wouldn't want to say that I wouldn't go to therapy because maybe I would. But if I did, I can tell you that I wouldn't tell anybody about it. Mm-mm. I don't think I would. I wouldn't tell anyone like, oh, hey, hey, look, I'm going. I don't think that's something I'd want to share because it's not. I don't think it'd be something that you're proud of. Like, good for you if you go to therapy. I, and it's nothing bad either. Yeah, no, it's nothing bad. Like, it's not not. I'm not saying it's something to hide, but I personally just feel very. Mm, I don't know what the word is like I just wouldn't want to be like oh look at her she's so broken she needs to go to therapy but it's okay to be broken Mm -hmm. most definitely and I feel like if we're here sitting here telling them that it's okay to not be okay we need to let ourselves not be okay Mm -hmm. go to therapy girl get it you do you if you had to teach someone how to grieve and give them advice on it. What would be a couple of words you'd tell them? If I had to teach someone. Or like give them a step by step on a how to, how to grieve. <sighs> advice. I can't because everyone's so different. Me personally, I think I would tell them, feel your pain. Mm-hmm. Let it hurt. Mm-hmm. Let it bring you down. Mm-hmm. Once. Once you're done, you get yourself back up and you keep on going. Yes, ma'am. That's pretty much, that's exactly what I would have said. Like, let yourself feel it, get up and go. Mm -hmm. How are you? I'm all right. Are you sure? Yes. I don't think I'm going to go home and cry. That's good. I was kind of worried. I know. We were talking about this for what, like the last four days? We were planning to do this much later in our journey 
mm-hmm. because we thought it was going to be too much for her. And I personally didn't want to see her go back to square one, I guess you can say, because you have come a long way. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Don't cry. I don't want to cry anymore. You've literally been with me through it Stop. all. Stop. Okay. <laughs> We're Shut not going to go there. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, <clears throat> we did think this was going to be a hard one. It was a little tough for her, mm-hmm. but she did it. And yeah, um, from this, like we said at the beginning, we did get a lot of feedback. I'm sorry, guys. My back is just yeah, my like <laughs> killing me. <laughs> We're sitting on these chairs and it's cold in here. So, it's yeah, um, <laughs> we need new chairs. <laughs> Anyways, um, we did receive a lot of feedback and we said, you know what? We need to talk about it because... There are so many people going through it right now and it's it's hard to just keep it all in and if we can be your voices and we can help you then that's what we're here for Mm -hmm. and it made it so much more clear this past weekend when i would walk in somewhere and right away the first thing that they would tell me would be like oh my god i saw your podcast it's so awesome i loved it and then once we received the personal messages it was like we're helping so yeah i think that's super awesome so hopefully my story helps somebody if it helps one person then i'm glad i i was able to sit here and cry for an hour we were able to talk about it yeah um i'm i'm done with my questions i don't know if you want to add anything i don't think so but if there's any other questions that you guys have regarding the subject, um, you can leave it in the comments or you can always send us a direct message through Instagram. Uh, we're under Gemini Therapy. Does it have a period? It's Gemini dot therapy. Mm-hmm. Again, I think I just want to say thank you so much for all the support. I really didn't expect that much that much feedback that much support that many likes like mm-hmm. what when we kept just seeing the numbers go up the views go up the <laughs> subscribers go up we would we send each other screenshots each other, like, this many mm-hmm. it's so awesome it feels so good and just again thank you like we can't thank you enough enough and i know like it's crazy to see to see it and say it because you see youtubers and they have like 1.7 million followers and we're like at 120 but to (laughs) us that's a lot and it's amazing that we're receiving this much support people that we didn't even expect yeah like that we don't even know um i think that the most thing that has impacted me through all this though is reading y'all's personal messages and i think it's more because they trust us i guess yeah it's very hard to open up to strangers and the fact that you feel like you can that just it's everything it just warms my heart because it's it's amazing that somebody that i don't know is messaging me about their life and telling me no i problem. relate to you or yeah. you've helped me or whatever so thanks um and i hope that we can help more people and if there's anything that you guys want to ask, like Lindsay said, DM us. Even if you don't want to put it in the comments, that's fine. Leave us a heart in the comments, though. Oh, yeah. But send us a little DM and share with us if there's anything you guys want to talk to us about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We have our little lemonade. Oh, yeah, we got lemonades <laughs> we, today. We're making it a thing now. <laughs> Hopefully we can get cute cups or something. I know we can get something personalized. Comfy chairs because my back is aching. This is basically, let us know what you guys think about our setup here. I like it. It's pink. It's girly. Mm-hmm. It's the vibe. It's very much us. Yes. I so like it. I think it's cute. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Turn on the notification bell so that you guys know when we upload our next video. Mm-hmm. And share with your friends. Yep. That's it. Bye, guys. (laughs) Bye.